So um, the balance view teaching is, is very simple. And um, even though it's very simple, some mornings when I get here, I can't remember what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is simple, so often I can remember. <laughs> if I just take a sip of my tea, gives me a few more seconds to figure it out. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, there's two different ways of using our mind, you could say. And uh, one is to struggle with uh, the experiences, the flow of experiences that we're having, thoughts, emotions, sensations, etc. Trying to micromanage them, trying to make them better or more pleasant or more impressive to other people. <laughs> That's one way of using the mind. The other way of using the mind is to do absolutely nothing about what's happening. <laughs> to just relax completely and um, make no effort whatsoever to be a particular way. Make no effort whatsoever to feel a particular way. Make no effort whatsoever to feel better or happier or more pleasant. And um, the first of those two ways of using our mind is what gives rise to suffering because there's an endless flow of experience and in as much as we insist on struggling with it that is how much we struggle <laughs> in our life and uh, conversely uh, allowing everything to be as it naturally is uh, you find that you are at peace regardless of what's happening even if you feel bad you are there is a a more fundamental sense of well-being that is obvious when you allow everything to be as it is that pervades the whole spectrum of experience from apparently pleasant to apparently unpleasant. So we have one practice that we recommend uh, in the Balance View teaching and that is to rest naturally for short moments repeated many times whenever you naturally remember. So while we're here together for this hour, you can, you can um, just practice that and experiment with it and play with it. So whenever you remember, just hang loose completely. Allow complete effortlessness. Don't try to feel good. Don't try to feel better. Don't try to agree with me. Don't try to disagree with me. Don't try to do anything. Don't try to decide if you like what I'm saying or not. I mean, that might happen spontaneously. <laughs> that You either do or don't, but it, it doesn't make any difference. The fact is that when you allow the flow of your experience to be as it is, in that moment, you know what true peace and true well-being is. So by repeating that short moment, whenever you remember, you gain familiarity with it. It becomes familiar to you, this innate peace that is everybody's birthright. Just like when you practice riding a bike when you were little. To begin with, it just seems impossible. You know, it's like, even though you can see people riding around on bikes, it just doesn't make any sense that it's possible to ride around on a two-wheeled uh, vehicle without falling over. But very quickly, by practicing for short moments repeated many times, now, probably, uh, you just you don't think about it. You just get on the bike and you ride it. Quite magic, really. So it's similar with short moments. You practice short moments whenever you remember. But over time, you, you're so familiar with it that you don't, in a way, you don't need to practice anymore. It just happens reflexively. As soon as you notice that you're struggling, you simply relax without thinking about it anymore. So just a couple of terms uh, before we listen to the talk from Candice. Um, just a couple of terms that we use often in, in this teaching. What is the talk we're going to listen to? Is that um, a more recent kind of, or is it? 
Did that, yeah, that's that's recent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you'll hear Candice uh, using the phrase open intelligence. And uh, when she uses that word, she's, it's a synonym of mind or reality or uh, it's the fundamental basis of all experience, the aware quality of mind which allows for all experience. This is open intelligence. And that is always present. That's, that's why we can have experiences is because open intelligence is present cognizant, aware mind is present. And uh, that's what you're resting as when you take a short moment to rest naturally. You're resting as that basic space of mind, awareness itself, which is always present, always stable, never affected by any experience. Ever since you've been born, Cognizant open intelligence has been present every single moment and no experience has ever um, blemished it in any way. It's completely reliable and always present and pervades everything. And then the other term you'll hear her use is data and that's, uh, that's a synonym of, well, it, we use it to refer to any and all experiences. So um, I just want to start with uh, a little exercise that we do, which um, for many people might, is a helpful way to recognize open intelligence. Because um, before anything else, this is what's important, is that all of us know what is, what is meant by that term directly in our own experience. Uh, because when you know what open intelligence is in your own experience, then you can rely on it for short moments repeated many times. So, um, if everyone just wants to stop thinking for a few moments, and you find that when you do that, that the alert, aware quality of mind still remains. So it's there when you're not thinking and it's there when you are thinking. And that as uh, kind of Sometimes it can seem like, well, so what, <laughs> you, know, you know, yeah, okay, aware, open intelligence is, is always present. Uh, so it can seem a bit like, so what, but it turns out that that's actually the source of true well-being. This is the source of fulfillment, is to become assured and settled in open intelligence. So, uh, like I said at the beginning, for the rest of our time together, just rest as that for, for a brief moment whenever you remember. You don't have to stop thinking to do that, by the way. It just makes it a bit easier for most people to recognize that open intelligence is in fact present and that it doesn't require any effort to make it present. When we take a short moment, we're not creating open intelligence or engineering it or accomplishing it. Open intelligence is already present. It already pervades all experience. So absolutely nothing clever needs to be done to make it so. <laughs> it's like having 50 pounds in your back pocket and not knowing that you have 50 pounds in your back pocket. And then one day somebody tells you, by the way, you have 50 pounds in your back pocket. And you go, oh, cool. <laughs> and then you can, you know, 50 pounds translates to value of whatever type you choose to use it for. And uh, so that 50 pounds was already there. And similarly, open intelligence is already your fundamental nature. And this teaching is is introducing you to that 
and offering a support system to gain assurance in it. And um, yeah, so the question about um, open intelligence giving you access to the all the knowledge of the universe. <clears throat> it, correlates well with the question about spontaneous benefit. Because uh, one thing that's certainly become clear to me uh, in my 10 years of, of being with this teaching is that uh, my capacity or our capacity as human beings is much more expansive than I th thought it was or assumed it was before. And uh, not in a kind of a weird way, you know, like, um, because it, particularly a statement like that, like open intelligence gives you access to all the knowledge of the universe. Well then, <laughs> I like, like most of what these people are saying, but that sounds a little bit far-fetched. Um, uh, but in terms of like everyday life, in my experience, what that translates to is a spontaneous uh, sensitivity and openness to knowing what best to do and say, or not do and not say, uh, in order to contribute most to yourself and other people. It's an instinctive intelligence that we all have when we allow everything to be as it is. And it's very... Uh, it's something I'm so grateful for because uh, it, it has allowed for intimacy in all of my relationships uh, that I, I love people and I love, you know, lots of, the, I have lots of good friends and family and um, so I was interested always in connecting uh, open-heartedly with people. And um, despite my interest in that, because half the time I was busy struggling with myself, <laughs> uh, my, my natural intimacy with others was diminished, uh, however much I was struggling with myself. So it's one of the things I'm most grateful for is uh, the ability to simply connect and uh, not need to make any effort in relationships. Just knowing what to say, knowing what to do without trying whatsoever. And um, it's interesting to see that uh, like I said at the beginning, that this true intimacy and this well-being is inseparable from all experience, including intense lust, sexual desire. Uh, it's self-fulfilling. It is fulfilled unto itself. <laughs> so it's funny... Um, we're such wild creatures, you know, there's emotions and desires and aversions flying all over the place all the time. There's no way of bringing it into like a, a sensible, <laughs> arranged mold. Just bleh, sexual desire, bleh, hatred, it's just all over the place all the time. <laughs> and uh, so to know that the fulfillment that we're looking for is inseparable from all of those things uh, is, is a, an amazing uh, breakthrough for all of us to have in our personal lives. And it's nice because it means then that you're not, um, if you know that you're, the fulfillment of sexual desire is sexual desire itself, and you don't have to bother anyone else about it. <laughs> you know, like, bother somebody else with your sexual desires. It's, uh, 
it doesn't mean that you don't have sex and have sexual uh, intimacy with people, but but you're not needing something from somebody, which if you are in, a, in an intimate relationship makes it a completely different thing. It makes it so much more beautiful and natural and resolves so many of the niggling struggles that come up in most relationships. If you want something from your partner, the result is struggles and niggles and <laughs> small conflicts or maybe big conflicts. And uh, so to be, to, it, you could say that it's taking full responsibility for our own mind realizing that our true fulfillment is already present means that we don't have to impose on other people anymore. Not just sexually, but uh, wanting anything from somebody only has the effect of diminishing what would otherwise be a natural and intimate interaction. If you want to be recognized, if you want to be uh, in, if you want people to be impressed by you, if you want to be respected, anything that you want from others is only a distraction from natural well-being and natural intimacy between you and the other person. Wanting nothing is, is the most uh, profound disposition. <laughs> Because there's no end to what you can give. It's not like a, a limited resource. That's what mind is intended to do, is to serve all beings. When you let it be as it is, that becomes obvious. That altruism is the natural disposition of a human being. If you make no effort whatsoever to be a good person, ironically, the result is... <laughs> that you are much more, you know, naturally skillful and sensitive and compassionate than, than you could possibly contrive. So, um, it's a different training to what we're used to, because usually we're born somewhere <coughs> in, a, in a certain culture and in a certain family, and we adopt certain ideas and frameworks of understanding about what ideally a person should be like. And then usually you try to emulate that. Um, but the problem is, is that depending on which culture you grow in, up in, it'll be a very different idea in the first place. Uh, and if you take it seriously and think it means something, then you'll get into conflict with other people who have a different idea. But secondly, even if, even if your culture's idea of what the perfect person ought to be like is true, the attempt to emulate it never quite works. Uh, you always fall short at least a little bit from this archetype of a perfect person. And um, even if it's like a really noble idea, like you want to be a good person, you want to be a compassionate person, you want to uh, contribute to uh, people, to society. Um, if, you, if you make no effort, you will do it a lot better <laughs> than trying to contrive it, trying to force it, trying to, like I said, trying to mold your flow of experiences into this picture of a good person. When you relax, there's just a spontaneous intelligence that's not to your credit. It's just there. <laughs> you didn't create it or achieve it. <laughs> it's not like a... See, at the moment, this is uh, very unusual, probably, in the big scheme of things, that. For, for somebody to know about open intelligence and to be assured of it to the extent that, you know, most of the time it's naturally obvious and, and uh, the, the beneficial capacity that is innately yours is, is in full expression. 
That's very unusual at the moment. Uh, but it's not a special thing. It's completely natural. <laughs> uh, it's only, you know, it, if, who knows, at some point in the future, if this became more normal, then it would just be, nobody would be making anything out of it, you know. <laughs> just so, oh yeah, humans are like beneficial, uh, wildly beneficial, uncontrollably beneficial creatures. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's nothing particularly to make out of it, just enjoy. <laughs> At the moment, it's unusual, so it's, so it's like, ooh, it seems like, but, it, but it's not, it's completely natural. <laughs> and, uh, and it's so uh, amazing, you know, that we, <clears throat> to be introduced to it and have support in this is, is a very fortunate situation. And um, um, so, yeah, I, I'd really really want to kind of warmly uh, for, for those of you who, are, who have come for the first time or one of the first times to just to give it a couple of months to really explore the teaching in your own experience um, because if, it, if this is something that you resonate with and something that you that you feel that you get benefit from it doesn't take long to feel significant benefits you know maybe you'd like a week or a one moment or uh, <laughs> not long anyway to, to, to know if this is something that you want to to explore more uh, and uh, yeah so just to come to these talks every Sunday and to um, and to just go on the website and check out the talks and the books on there everything's for free up there and just explore and and experiment and and uh, and see what happens for a couple of months. I would really recommend that. Uh, and if it is something that you find you want to you want to take up more uh, and explore in more depth, then uh, the the next step I would really recommend is to do a training called the Twelve Empowerments, which. Uh, which is kind of like um, it's it, it makes a huge difference in in terms of the actual experience of open intelligence being obvious to you in your day to day life, as opposed to just glimpses here and there. The twelve empowerments is kind of geared towards helping, giving a platform for open intelligence to be obvious to you all of the time, increasingly uh, so. Um, so yeah, I'd really recommend that for if you, if you find that you want to really uh, take on this teaching full-heartedly to, to, to do the 12 empowerments.